Sunday, it was Easter too. And here we are again, the community of faith gathered. How lovely it is to see you. And as is the tradition, uh, the recent tradition since uh, Reverend Brenda has been among us, um, we will pass the peace with one another to start our service to reconcile one with another. And so uh, we can pass the peace by some some folks like Jennifer know how to do the hokey hokey, um, but and you can do that or you can do um, peace be with you, peace be with me. And so please stand and pass the peace. And I say, may peace be with you all. Also with you. Please be seated. Friends, we are indeed the body of Christ many and varied in gender, color, sexual orientation and identity, age, class, and ability. And we are all welcome here. Welcome here. I'm Reverend Roz Vincent Haven, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. We are reminded each week by Reverend Brenda, who will be back in this place next Sunday that your presence here changes things. It changes the world by the act of inviting God into our hearts, into our thoughts, and into our community. Amen. Let's now turn to our prayer of uh, call of worship, and it's on the screen. Jesus said, Jesus said, Jesus said, Jesus said, Be my sheep. And in response, we say, Here is my heart, take it and seal it. Let us worship God with all our hearts. And we begin with hymn number 345 from Voices United. Children join to sing.
Isn't it great to sing hallelujahs again? Oh, don't do that in Lent. And for the last seven weeks, we have been following the life and the faith of Peter. Despite being one of Jesus' most loyal disciples, Peter still made mistakes. He was faithful and messy, humble and afraid, loving and curious. Friends, we're a lot like Peter. Despite our faith, we too make mistakes. Despite our belief, we carry unbelief. Despite our love, we can cause hurt. So like Peter, let us return to God in prayer, confessing the truth of our lives. God's grace does not stop with that humble yet fearful disciple. God's grace reaches all the way to us. Let us pray. Gracious God, like Peter, we crawl out of the boat only to see Friends, the first time that Peter saw Jesus after the crucifixion, Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? This repetition was not because Jesus doubted Peter's word. This repetition was Jesus offering Peter grace. You see, the last time Peter, Jesus and Peter were together, Peter said three times, I do not know that man. So when Jesus returned, he asked Peter, do you love me? And in that moment, he allowed Peter to turn his denials into love. Friends, the grace of our, love, our God knows no end. When we stumble, when we fall, when we deny God or cause harm, Jesus meets us where we are and offers us a second chance. So rest in this good news. Does God love you? Yes, yes, yes. God loves you. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God for a love that never ends. Scripture reading from the message from Acts 9. Oh, sorry. From Act 9, 1 to 20. All this time, Saul was breathing down the necks of the master's disciples, out for the kill. He went to the chief priests and got arrest warrants to take the, to the meeting places in Damascus, so that if he found anyone there belonging to the way, whether men or women, he could arrest them and bring them to, to Jerusalem. He set off when he got to the outskirts of Damascus. He, sorry, he set off when he got to the outskirts of Damascus. He was suddenly dazed by a blinding flash of light. As he fell to the ground, he heard a voice. Saul, Saul, why are you out to get me? He said, who are you, master? I am Jesus, the one you are hunting down. I want you to get up and enter the city. In the city, you'll be told what to do next. His companions stood there dumbstruck. They could hear the sound, but couldn't see anyone. While Saul, picking himself up, up off the ground, found himself stone blind. They had to take him by the hand and lead him off up off the ground. Um, sorry, they had to take him and by the hand and lead him into Damascus. He continued blind for three days. He ate nothing, drank, drank nothing. There was a disciple in Damascus by the name of Aeneas. The master spoke to him in a vision. And Aeneas, yes, master, he answered, get up and go over to Straight Avenue. Ask at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus. His name is Saul. He is there praying. He has just had a dream in which he saw a man from Tarsus 
named Aeneas, entered the house and lay hands on him so he could see again. And Aeneas protested, Master, you can't be serious. Everybody's talking about this man and the terrible things he's been doing. His reign of terror against your people in Jerusalem. And now he's shown up here with papers from the chief priest that gave him license to do the same to us. But the master said, don't argue. Go, I have picked him as my personal representative to non-Jews and kings and Jews. And now I'm about to show him what he's in for, the hard suffering that goes with his job. So Ananias went and found the house, placed his hands on blind Saul and said, Brother Saul, the master sent me, the same Jesus you saw on your way here. He sent me so you could see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. No sooner were the words out of his mouth than something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. He could see again. He got to his feet, was baptized, and sat down with them to a hearty meal. Saul spent a few days getting acquainted with the Damascus disciples, but then went right to work, wasting no time, preaching in the meeting places that this Jesus was the Son of God. They were caught off guard by this, and not at all sure they could trust him. They kept saying, isn't this the man who wreaked havoc in Jerusalem among the believers? It did, and didn't he come here to do the same thing, arrest us and drag us off to jail in Jerusalem for, sen for sentencing by the high priest? But their suspicions didn't slow Saul down for even a minute. His momentum was up now, and he plowed straight into the opposition, disarming the Damascus Jews and trying to show them that Jesus was the Messiah. John 21, 1-19 from the message. After this, Jesus appeared again to the disciples, this time at the Tiberias Sea, the Sea of Galilee. This is how he did it. Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the brothers Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter announced, I'm going fishing. The rest of them replied, we're going with you. They went out and got in the boat. They caught nothing that night. When the sun came up, Jesus was standing on the beach, but they didn't recognize him. Jesus spoke to them. Good morning, did you catch anything for breakfast? They answered, no. He said, throw the net off the right side of the boat and see what happens. They did what he said. All of a sudden, there were so many fish in it, they weren't strong enough to pull it in. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the master. Then Simon Peter realized that it was the master. He threw on some clothes, for he was stripped for work and dove into the sea. The other disciples came in by boats, for they weren't far from the land, a hundred yards or so, pulling along the net full of fish. When they got out of the boat, they saw a fire laid with fish and bread cooking on it. Jesus said, bring some of the fish you've just caught. Simon Peter joined them and pulled the net to shore. 153 big fish. And even with all those fish, the net didn't rip. Jesus said, breakfast is ready. Not one of the disciples dared ask, who are you? They knew it was the master. Jesus then took the bread and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus had shown himself alive to the disciples since being raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, master, you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. He then asked the second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, master, you know I love you. Jesus said, shepherd my sheep. Then he said it a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was upset that he asked for the third time. Do you love me? So he answered, master, you know everything there is to know. You've got to know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I'm telling you the very truth now. When you were young, you dressed yourself and went wherever you wished. But when you get old, you'll have to stretch out your hands while someone else dresses you and takes you where you do not want to go. He said this to hint at the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he commanded, follow me. Now, we have Erica here. I don't know if we've got um, some kids online, but Erica, you can come on up. And I have something for you. I've got a story for you this morning. And I think that Reverend Brenda goes down and sits here. Would you like to come up and sit with me? When she gets her shoes on? Or you can do up, you can come up without shoes on, you know. You can come up and sit. 
And are there other, are there other um, folks online? You might have one online, Roz. Maybe Jamie might be online? Maybe. Maybe. Well, we're going to have a good time anyway. I brought something to show you today. What's this? What's it called? A bucket or a pail. It's called a bucket or a pail. Yes, you're right. How'd she get so smart? Well, I've got a story about a bucket today for you, and I think that Stephen's got pictures online for us. It's called, Have You Filled Your Bucket Today? That's kind of a strange title, isn't it? Eh? Yeah. Well, there it is there. So it says here, all day long, Everyone, that's everyone in the whole wide world, walks around carrying an invisible bucket. Did you know that? No, I didn't either. You can't see it, but it's there. You have a bucket. Your mom and dad each have a bucket. If you have a sister or a brother, they have a bucket. Your grandparents, friends, neighbors, all of us have a bucket. Everyone, everyone carries an invisible bucket. Your bucket has one purpose only. Its purpose is to hold your good thoughts and good feelings about yourself. You feel very happy and good when your bucket is full, but oh, oh. And you feel very sad and lonely when your bucket is empty. Other people feel the same way too. They're happy when their buckets are full and they're sad when their buckets are empty. It's great to have a full bucket and this is how it works. We're gonna find out how we, how we keep our buckets full. You need other people to fill your bucket and other people need you to fill theirs. So how do you fill the bucket? You wanna turn the page for me? There you go. You feel a bucket when you show love to someone when you say or do something kind, or even when you give someone a smile. And I know you're a really good smiler, aren't you? Yes. That's being a bucket filler. A bucket filler is a loving, caring person who says or does nice things to make others feel special. When you make someone feel special, you're filling a bucket. Let me turn the page. But you can also dip into a bucket and take out some good feelings. You dip into a bucket when you make fun of someone, when you say or do mean things, and even when you ignore someone, that's being a bucket dipper. A bully is a bucket dipper. A bucket dipper says or does mean things that makes others feel bad. Many bucket dippers have an empty bucket. They think they can fill their own bucket by dipping into someone else's, but that will never work. You never fill your own bucket when you dip into somebody else's. But guess what? When you fill someone's bucket, you fill your own bucket too. Look, see, they're filling each other's buckets. You feel good when you help others feel good too. On the beach. All day long, we are either filling up or dipping into each other's buckets by what we say and what we do. Try to fill a bucket and see what happens. Your love for your mom and dad, why not tell them you love them? You can even tell them why. Your caring words will fill their bucket right up. Watch for smiles to light up their faces you will feel them smiling too. A smile is a good clue that you've filled a bucket. If you practice, you'll become a great bucket filler. And you know what? I think you're a great bucket filler. You think you're a great bucket filler? I think so. Just remember that everyone has an invisible bucket and think what you can say or do to fill it. Oops. What are some of the ideas? You can smile and say hi to your bus driver. He has a bucket too. You can invite a new kid at school to play with you. 
You could write a thank you note to your teacher. You could spend, tell your grandpa that you like to spend time with him. There are many ways to fill a bucket. You know of any ways to fill a bucket? No? You can think about it. Bucket filling is fun and easy to do. It doesn't matter how young or old you are. It doesn't cost any money, and it doesn't take much time. And remember, when you fill someone else's bucket, you're filling your own too. See, look at their buckets are filling each other. And look at this. When you're a bucket filler, you make your home, your school, your neighborhood, better places to be. Bucket filling makes everyone feel good. So why not decide to be a bucket filler today and every day? Just start each day by saying to yourself, I'm going to do something to fill someone's bucket today. Even the teddy has Yeah, even the teddy needs, see, she's got a little, little bucket too. A little tiny bucket. Oh, it's a little tiny teddy, it's right? So tiny. Yeah. Tiny little yeah, tiny there. Bucket. See? The teddy has a little tiny bucket. And at the end of each day, you ask yourself, did I fill a bucket today? Yes, I did. And she dropped it. Oh, oh dear. Well, she looks like happy. Maybe she'll catch her again, do you think? Yeah. I hope so. The bow came off. Yeah, the bow came off her head. And, and that's that when you say, yes, you did, even though you kind of threw up your bear with her bucket, that's the life of a bucket filler. And that's you. And I bet you she's going to catch that bucket and, and that bear again, you think? I think so. And that's you, as I think you're a really good bucket filler. So this week, can you think about that? Think about filling your bucket and filling daddy and mommy's bucket and grandma's bucket and the kids at school's bucket. You want to think about that? And even with your toes, you can fill a bucket. Well, thank you very much for spending time with me. And I think you're going to church school now. I love these shoes. Very nice shoes. And uh, can I help you down? Okay. All right. Off you go. Thank you, Erica. And thanks to Stephen for getting these nice pictures for us. And now we're going to sing. So I guess there's not a church school today. Um, so we're going to sing number 166 in Voices United, Joy Comes with the Dawn.
seated. The Sunday after Easter is odd, isn't it? How odd it feels to return to the sanctuary this day, this Sunday, the first Sunday after Easter. So different from the smells of Easter flowers which filled our lungs as we took our seats. Last Sunday, the ex excitement at, in the air was palpable. There were squeals from the children dancing up here in front and the place was packed with people. People we hadn't seen in months drifted in. By the end of the service, your blood had been pumped. You had sung the greatest hymns and felt sure that the power of God had burst the bonds with ease. We all know, knew absolutely that we were celebrating the birth of the risen Christ. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. And so today, you might not have known what to expect. A week after the explosive joy of the resurrection, would the joy survive, be fading now slowly? Would worship, as usual, resume, almost as if Easter hadn't happened? Curious day today. The crowd has been condensed significantly. You look around and see folks here who are regulars. You are the ones who week after week come to worship, wanting whatever God wants to give you. You are the ones who come here week in and week out to listen to the story again with the conviction that through believing you may have life in Christ's name. Now I ask you, how is life different for us than it was for those disciples who brooded over the resurrection and ultimately went back to their work? What do you do when life gets turned around? When we encounter the risen Christ, whether immediately after the resurrection or years later, things change. Attitudes, directions, self-awareness, hope. In today's readings, we see people who encounter the risen Christ in the midst of their daily lives. All of them are changed as a result. Christianity is full of stories who, of people who have been able, with God's help, to begin again. This Sunday, we hear about two of those people, Peter and Paul, two great leaders of the early church. Peter and Paul were both radically changed by their encounters with the risen Christ. Both experienced life-changing forgiveness and radical transformation. From angry, frightened individuals, they became spirit-filled, loving and empowered people who devoted the rest of their lives to sharing their love of Christ. Yet their stories are very different. We hear about their experiences and we are encouraged to be open to all the many different ways in which the spirit works. Just as the spirit of the risen Christ was alive in the experiences we read about in our scriptures today, the spirit is still alive today, friends, in all those who have been able to begin again, changing old patterns and being released from the bonding, bonding, bondage of old oppressions. The possibilities are no less available today than they have been in any time in history. Even now, Jesus is calling us each day to begin again, to be church together, to take care of the lambs and to feed the sheep in the midst of our ordinary lives and so live as apostles now. First, let's take another look at the story of our friend Peter. I like this man. Peter is a very real person with real fears and real sins. And yet Peter has in him a great passion and a humble integrity. He is given to impetuousness and putting his foot in his mouth. And I know I've been there. But his heart is in the right place. 
Peter is just a regular guy, just like one of us, sitting here in worship today. Our gospel story, in our gospel story, we see Peter who says to the guys, I'm going fishing. Who wants to come with me? And the rest of the disciples say, yeah, we're coming too. And so off they set, back to what was familiar to them, back to what they knew. I see this as a story of reality. It is for the disciples the same as it is for us today. You return to what you do. Easter is glorious, but you can't live there. You experience the ecstasy of Easter, but then you have to come back down from that emotional high with all of your questions and your confusion and do whatever it is that you do. And so the disciples go fishing. Their fishing takes place in the Sea of Tiberias, Galilee. And it takes place at night for two reasons. First, because the fish are easier to catch at night. And second, so the fish will be uh, fresh to be sold at the market in the morning. We are told that although the disciples have been fishing all night, their net is still empty. The spotter on the beach tells them to try the right side of the boat and they'll find fish. What Jesus says to the people in the boat is, look, what you're doing isn't working. Try something else. And sure enough, they throw the net out to the other side and have so many fish that they can hardly bring them in. John, the one that was loved, suddenly recognized the spotter as Jesus. Imagine the awkward excitement in the boat that morning. A distant but familiar voice beckons them to try and fish on the other side of the boat. When the net is filled to bursting, so is their excitement in realizing who is calling to them. Simon Peter is so overcome that he jumps ship and impulsively swims to shore in an obvious display of rekindled dedication. I cannot help but think that second thoughts and some apprehensive apprehension might have accompanied his excited strokes to shore. For Peter and the others, the ups and downs of the past few years, and the last week especially, have taken their toll. The empty tomb was a vindication and a victorious climax to the challenge that had shaken the world, changed their lives, and made them aliens even to their own households. And now it was over. Now they could go home. Or could they? Jesus has fish and bread waiting for them and tells them to bring some of their catch to share. He eats and drinks with the disciples, breaking in, distributing the bread in a way that caused them to recognize him. The breaking of sharing of bread has already become a familiar sign of his presence. Then Jesus pointedly asks Peter, do you love me more than these others do? We are reminded at the Last Supper that Peter boldly professed that even if all the others deserted Jesus, he would never desert him. It was, of course, a statement he could not live up to. Now Peter responds without making any comparisons between himself and the others. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus responds, take care of my lambs. Jesus asks a second time and a third time, Peter denied Jesus more than the others. These questions are really a process of forgiving. Peter denied him three times, and now he affirms his love three times. Just as, be as Peter begins to feel hurt, awareness dawns. He recognizes that he's been given a chance to begin again. He has been given a vocation which will um, vindicate all the many mistakes he's made. How full of relief and gratitude Peter must have been. How comforting this story still is for us struggling believers today. The disciples went back to what they knew. That's really what the resurrection is all about. A call to go back to what you are and what you do, but do it in a new way. They didn't become super evangelists all of a sudden. They were still fisher folk at heart. The resurrection makes sense if it touches you where you are. 
where your reality is. That's Paul's story as well. The, the same zealousness that he had as a persecutor, he has as a proclaimer. We read in Luke's account in Acts of the, conserv the uh, conversion of Paul of Tarsus, who later became known as Apostle Paul. Before his, Tarsus, uh, his, before his Damascus road encounter with Christ, Saul did what he believed had to be done to defend the faith of his ancestors against what he perceived as dangerous new teachings. He, he violently opposed the growth of the Christian community who were beginning to know as, known as followers of the way. On the road to Damascus, however, Paul, Saul experienced a radical transformation. He literally saw the light and encountered the risen Christ. He falls down and goes blind. Paul says to Jesus, Paul says, Jesus, your pharisaic legalism isn't working. Try something new. Paul, too, had the opportunity to begin again. He went through a period of blindness after which he regained his sight and was filled with the Holy Spirit and was baptized by Ananias. Paul became one of the more ener most energetic and enthusiastic evangelism evangelists the Christian church has ever known. He was like a person on fire with new meanings and purpose, proclaiming the power of the risen Christ to all that he met. It was a revisioning. He was still Paul, but a rededicated and redirected Paul. This amazing new beginning and change of direction was symbolized by Saul of Tarsus changing his name to Paul. Like Peter, Paul is given a chance to start over. Peter and Paul are both radically changed by their encounters with the risen Christ. There is no denying the inner truth of these stories and their powerful message of forgiveness and hope to all of us believers. The good news is that we too can begin again as true disciples of the risen Christ each new moment of time. This is true both for us as individuals and for us as church together. We know this at Emmanuel. We are heeding the call to begin again as we celebrate God together in community, as we revision a viable and prosperous community of faith. Like Peter and Paul, we have been given the chance to begin again, to hear our great commission and live out our mission as church in the 21st century. The possibilities for starting over are indeed no less available today than they have ever been. And when we notice Jesus with us in our ordinary lives, in our church community, in our modest families, our common jobs, as we as we were, just as we are, as the apostles were then, as we are today. In the last six weeks, we have been in a time of prayerful discernment together about what it would be to begin again here at Emmanuel. We have been invited into silence and solitude as we pray individually and together and listen deeply to what God is calling us to be now in our time and place. We have prayed for trust in God's leading, acceptance of what must be, release of what is no longer. We need to release what is not desired and wonder what God might be up to if we just lean in, into that embrace Friends, this is a, a time of new beginning for Emmanuel and for all of us together. This week, we listen deeply for God's wisdom to guide our way. We are open to transformation and change, or are we? Can we intentionally and courageously lean into God's wisdom as we begin again as a faith community? Will our individual and collective ego 
edge God out? Or will God's words of wisdom be noticed and followed? Where is it that God is calling us to begin again? Friends, we are called to be the people of the resurrection, followers of Jesus' way, of Christ's way, being apostles here in our common places. That is what beginning again is all about. Breakfast. What's more common and ordinary than breakfast? Sometimes, I don't know about you, but I eat my breakfast and I haven't even combed my hair yet or brushed my teeth. We plop down in front of our cornflakes in our jammies, eyes puffy with sleep and grouchy and tired still. Peter was sopping wet, not from a shower, but from boldly and perhaps carelessly jumping out of the boat. So why is this lesson delivered as something as simple as sharing breakfast? It's because Easter tells us that Jesus always meets us in the middle of our mornings, in the middle of our lives, in the middle of our fishing or traveling, our playing or our crying and our laughing, in the middle of our discernment, in the middle of us being church together. We believe it. We say in church, the Lord be with you. We pray it sometimes. Come, Jesus, be our guest. These stories tell us, I can always invite Jesus into my life, to my breakfast, because he has first invited me. That is no fish story, friends. That's gospel. The disciples went back to work, but Jesus was still with them. It wasn't over. Over is when we fail to carry the resurrection within us. Over is when we put Easter in a closet, only to dig it out again next year. Over is when we can't return, we can't remember that we too can begin again. Over is when we give up hope or refuse to change. Over is when we forget and when we think we carry the burdens of the world alone. Over is when we fail to realize that we are part of the family. It wasn't over for Peter or Paul or the disciples, and it is not over for us here at Emmanuel. Jesus the Christ lives on after Easter Sunday, transforming, building, using, nurturing, fulfilling, and feeding us, calling us also to take care of the lambs. No matter what else changes, we know that Jesus' resurrection lives on. He lives on in our ordinary, everyday working lives, always giving us a chance to begin again. Amen. Let us pray, and today we're, our pastoral prayer it will have a call and response, which is on the screen. Holy God, ever present with us, guiding us and nudging us toward the fulfillment of your kingdom here on earth, thanks be to you for the windows of possibility you offer us. We thank you for the green grass beneath our feet, a new bud's blossoming in the soft spring rain. Humbly, we give you thanks for the opportunity to come together as church community for the, and for the ability to make a difference, to begin again both as individuals and as a family in Christ. May we be ever aware of the abundant love you extend to us. Help us to discover the possibilities we have to extend that love to others. Gracious God, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. Parent of the universe, we pray for our world and for all her peoples. Today, we especially pray for the people who are still living in terror because of war and disaster. We pray for the innocent civilians of Gaza and those of the international community attempting to bring relief from starvation at their peril. Where war continues without the hope of peace talks, which could ultimately lead to an end of violence and war in that torn region. May their leaders turn from violence and strife to construct 
a real and lasting settlement. We pray for the people of Ukraine still embroiled in a war not of their making. May we in the international community lend support and care to all those who continue to suffer in situations we cannot even imagine. Holy God, teach us a sense of solidarity with all people of our home, the earth. Gracious God, hear our prayer. Faithful and just God, we give you thanks and pray for our country Canada and our community here at Emmanuel. We thank you for the freedom we have to seek knowledge and speak our beliefs without fear in our country. We are grateful for our democracy in Canada and we pray for the courage to act to uphold and sustain it in the face of outside and inside forces which would deny it. We thank you too for the opportunity to be a faith community together. Help us to be ever aware of our responsible to be your stewards in our time and place, using our power to reach out to others and share the love you have given us as we seek to bring spiritual guidance and wisdom, hope and comfort, harmony and understanding to all in community. Gracious God, hear our prayer. In your Jesus. Tender and loving God, be with all who are ill today. We pray for those on our prayer list and all those not named but known to you. Comfort them and surround them with your healing presence. We pray also for all those who are distressed with burdens they must bear and those who are grieving the death of someone that they love. Holy One, enfold them with your love and ease their pain. Help us to embrace one another in community. And now, gracious God, we ask that you hear our personal and private prayers to you this day. Gracious God, hear our prayer and in your love answer. God, we have been back and forth, to and fro, on this journey of faith. For every time that you walked the valley with us, for every time that you have met us on the mountaintop, and for every time you've stayed, st stayed still while we ran towards you, we give you our thanks. Never stop meeting us here, meeting us now, gathering us in. With wandering and grateful hearts, we pray in the words of the risen Christ who taught us to pray, our mother and our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses, as we forgive our trespasses, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, and the glory. Friends, God has given us all that we have and made us all that we are. In thanksgiving for the abundance we have received, let us now present our morning offering.
Let us pray together. Accept, gracious God, these gifts as expressions of our gratitude for your Easter promise and presence. Let only be your curious and the least peace we know. We are thankful that you found our hearts, that your spirit continues to comfort us, serve the church, and encourage us to live the truth we find, and guide us to seek the truth that you can Thank you. Amen. We're closing him in community today, and I understand we're going to have a liturgical dance here at this one. Um, is number 352 in Voices United. I danced in the morning. Let's sing together. <laughs> ups and downs. Join Christ in the healing and the speaking words of freedom, witness to the sacred in our midst of life. And our God, may that God, the source of all love, Jesus, the risen one, love incarnate, and the Holy Spirit, love's power, be with each and every one of you and with all of us together now and forevermore. Amen.